as I'm breathing, as long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to praise the Lord, oh my soul.
will bring praise, I will bring praise. No weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice, I will declare, God is my victory and He is
Just take one moment before we start singing, before the music starts playing again. Just take one minute to acknowledge the goodness of God. How awesome He is. You cannot even put into words how great He is. The things that He's doing for us in our lives, things that He's already done for us. Through the good times and through the bad, He's always been there for us. So just take this moment, just lift your hands. Just really press it.
How majestic is your name Oh Jesus, wonderful, powerful You're the Lord of all How majestic is your name How majestic is your name Oh Jesus, wonderful, powerful Majestic is your name. How majestic is your name. Jesus, wonderful, powerful. You're the Lord of all. How majestic is your name. it says this about his name today it says and there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved by the name of Jesus today there is salvation in no one else not in any prophet not in any spiritual leader nothing any other God for there is no other name under heaven given to us given to men by which we must be saved, but through the name of Jesus. You know, every single week when we partake of Holy Communion, what we do is we acknowledge Christ's finished work on Calvary's cross. We say that we acknowledge that he died and he rose again for our sins today, and there's no other name by which we are saved beside Jesus Christ today. And so today, as the emblems are shared around, just want us to continue to meditate upon, you know, the power in that name, that power that brings breakthrough to your life, that power that brings healing, that power that dead is raised to life again. Meditate on that name today. I just pray that we find ourselves worthy as we would partake today of Holy Communion. Search your hearts and if there's any sin that is found in us, let's begin to go before God, even as we sing.
that when we call, you've answered, God. We thank you, God, that when we ask, God, we received, God. And today, God, without even asking, God, you died on Calvary's cross for us, God. And we say thank you, God, that you have given us a name that is above every name, that name that we can call to for breakthrough in our lives, that name that we can call upon for healing, that name that we can call upon, God, when we have sinned and you are faithful and you are just to forgive us, God. So, Lord, today, God, we accept your finished work on Calvary's cross. Today, God, I bless this cup that represents your blood that was shed for us, God. I bless this bread that represents your body that was broken, that was bruised for us, God. We accept, God, that by your stripes we have been healed. And today, God, we say thank you for your finished work on that cross. We will call upon no other name but your name only for the salvation, God. And Lord, today I thank you, God. Lord, today if there's any sin that is found in us, search our hearts right now, God. Take our sin away, God. Take our reproach away from us so that we can partake with you wordily today, God, in this holy communion. I thank you, God, for your blessings as a people, as a church. We thank you in no other name but Jesus. Amen and amen. At this time, let us partake of the bread. And now let us partake of the cup. Amen. Amen. How many of you had a great time in worship today? Amen. Amen. It's great to worship God. Amen. He is great. He is majestic. Amen. Amen. Let's all have a seat at this time. You know, today, as we move along in our service, um, you know, normally we would have an object lesson at this point. You know, but I want to invite Brother Labrado instead. You know, we want to share a word of testimony. You know, whatever God has placed in our heart, in His heart today. You know, He wants to share a word of testimony with us today. So let's put our hands together and welcome Brother Labrado today. Morning, Church. <clears throat> so you know, uh, you say if it, it was done once and it was good, you do it twice. So you know, it's it's a delight to share of the goodness of God as my dear brother Nigel saying. You know, it always touched me there. And um, <clears throat> my testimony today would be of God's goodness, um, not just in giving us tangible things, but sometimes, you know, in the little things, when you're in need and you, you turn to God, how he will direct your path. At the beginning, at the middle of last year in 2022, again, somewhere in October, I was faced with, with some, I was faced with certain uncertainties I should say that I need to make certain decisions in my life in the upcoming future which was very close and I had to make some 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 changes in my life especially my life my home my work even church and it, and these and these uncertainties were coming at me very strong and very fast and I had to make decisions and I started to ponder on it so much that it was bringing anxiety on me it was bringing me, making me feel sick, and I was, in a way, losing hope. But right in the midst of that, I saw what God was doing, and the Spirit of God started to lead me to His Word. And I thank God for His Word, and He can turn my heart to His Word to find the answer. And, and right there, I start to remember what the psalmist said, I will remember the Lord, surely, that's in Psalm 77, surely I remember His wonderful works. And God was showing me there at that time, from the, times, from the time I was saved at the age of 30, I'm now 46, he had started to put my mind back into retrospect, into looking back to what the hands of God was doing in my life, how faithful he was, how his goodness and mercies were following me. And that started to, to impact my, how I was feeling and thinking now. And as the Lord continued to work in me, he started to lead me to scripture again, saying, telling me that, don't be, worried, don't be anxious for anything. Philippians 4 again started to magnify before me. But in all things through prayer, supplication, thanksgiving, I started to lay before the Lord. That's in October last year. Straight through to December, straight through to an everything when my decisions had to be made somewhere in the middle of this year. And I, I laid in prayer continuously, continuously every day, laying my request before God. And also there, the Lord started to remind me in Proverbs Proverb 3. You know, the Lord said, trust, trust in the Lord. Lean not in, unto your own understanding. 
And, you know, and, and then I started to think, get my mind started to, to go back on the Lord. Hear what, God, I'm going to trust you. You see, it was uncertain. Up to, I don't know what tomorrow was bring, what tomorrow would, would have bring. I do not know what is coming in the future. But I had to trust in his sovereignty and his supremacy to lead me through this. And the Lord started to show me again. Hear what? In Proverbs 11, he said, in the multitude of counsel, there will be safety. God started to put people around me, started to direct and orchestrate the paths of other men and women in my life now. And even to my footstep in their path, so I can have the counsels of wise men, wise women. And I want to thank God that he was able to intervene in situations like that. You know, sometimes we long for healing. We long for food. We long for money. We long for financial breakthrough, which are good. But in this case, I, want, I needed understanding. I needed wisdom. I needed knowledge for the future. I needed to make a decision. And God came to me and by his spirit led me to his word to feed on that and also to, to direct my path so I can make the right decision. So I leave this with you as a testimony. You know, God said in Philippians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul said, my God will supply all your need according to his mercies and richness in Christ. You know, I want to thank God that he came into my life and direct my path and direct me to people, direct me to prayer. Teach me, do not trust in myself, trust in him. So I can make that decision and move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Brother Labrado. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know, God is concerned about our entire life, all areas of our life. God is concerned. You know how the Bible says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God and he will give it to us liberally. And I thank God that our brother knew his God so much, so, so much that he could go to him and share his needs and ask for counsel, ask for guidance, because God wants to guide our lives. God wants to direct us. God wants to bless us. And he wants to prosper our lives. And I thank God for his leading upon his life. At this time is our jail of moment where we take a short break, meet, greet each other, love each other, have a cup of coffee together as we come back and resume for our preaching of God's word. So at this time, we'll take a short break to meet, greet, and love each other. God bless. Jesus, 
this song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs and a thousand. upon us this morning. I thank God this morning in spite of what? The Bible says all things will work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purposes. And I thank God this morning that God sees us, he knows us, he is looking down at us, and he is working out all things together for good. Amen? Praise the Lord. Were you blessed by this morning's message on love? 
Okay, First Corinthians chapter 13. Very good. The greatest of these is love. And this morning, it's my happy privilege to again introduce our pastor, a man of God who truly loved God, who truly studied the word of God, a pastor who cares about you. Our pastor cares about you. He loves people and he loves God. And I believe when you love people and love God, God does the rest. Amen? So let's put our hands together as we welcome our pastor, Pastor Aaron Ramdas, to the pulpit. <laughs> Thank you very much, my dearest mother. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> your mother must say nice things about you. Eh? <laughs> must, must. If everybody else say bad, your mother must love you very much. Eh? So I feel the love this morning. All right, guys. So welcome again. Good morning to everyone. Um, so glad that you all are here with us, even those online watching. So glad to have you with us. Amen. You know, I see every week that we have a lot of work to do at our second service. Amen. But I feel like the second service is much more energetic. Maybe because you all got that extra two hours sleep um, or maybe an hour and a half. You know, um, you know I, I feel a bit more energy. It's surprising, you know, that there's so much more energy in the second service than the first. Yes, good, good. It's because Sister Peppy is here, you know, um, and by that time, Brother Ryan and those guys warm up a little bit, so, yeah, so we're ready to go, right? All right, guys, so again, welcome. Um, I hope that you all have been enjoying our service. That's why I think, you know, worship was, uh, we, we spent a great time in worship this morning, amen? Yeah. Really a great time. I thank God that you was here with us. So, you know, we want to go into the Word of God today, and, you know, we are just continuing our series called the Dear Church Series, Dear Church and the reason why we, you know, um, began to share about this particular uh, um, series is because, uh, you know, we believe um, that as a church, we need to begin to decide what does God actually want from us as a church. You know, when you start a new job, you know, it's very difficult for you to understand how you are to effectively function in your role if it is the boss don't come and say, hey, this is your role. This is what you have to do and this is how you have to do it else you might actually begin to disappoint and deviate from what is expected. In the same way, I believe that as a church, you know, my really, my true heart's, uh, you know, belief is that I think that the church has not been what it's supposed to be for 2,000 years. I feel after 2,000 years, we still are not being the way God intends us to be. And that's why people in the world, many times, they have things to say about us as a church. Has anybody ever heard, you know, the normal talk, and them, and is a Christian, man? But and them is go to church, man? Them is the kind of people who go to church, they pass that son, man. And so we hear it so often in our, in our world, in our life. Um, you know, it begs me to, 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 to wonder whether it is people will just always have something bad to say, which is true. Or two, whether it is we just aren't being what God has called us to be. And that's the reason why, you know, that you know, people in the world, we are not consistent in our walk, in our character. So what I decided is that if we have to know how we are to be as a church, we need to go back to the word of God. For far too long, we have followed the traditions of men as it pertains to church. We have decided upon opinions and what feels right and what feels good based on culture. Churches today have even begun to, 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 to change the way they do things based on the culture of the world. How we dress, how we act, how we talk, how we preach to suit the fancies of the world. And I feel like that's so wrong because I feel if we have to be the true church of Christ, we have to do it God's way and not man's way. Amen? And that's why, you know, Paul did... Um, such a great work, being inspired by the, word, by, by the Holy Spirit to give us letters to know how to live. And so in the New Testament, we find that Paul wrote uh, almost two-thirds of the New Testament as letters that Paul wrote to the different churches. One in particular was the church at Corinth. You know, um, that's the letters that we call the Corinthians. And, you know, things were so bad in Corinth that he wrote two letters to them. And I always ask if God has to write a letter to the church at jail of called the Jelovians, right? What would he write? Would he have to write about five letters to us? You know, maybe he might see a lot of things going on that he doesn't like. I hope it's just maybe a half a letter. He has to say, are you doing good? Continue. And that's it, you know. But in Corinth, there were so many things going wrong that he had to address. And, you know, that's what we want to talk about today. You know, we have spoken about a dozen Ds as a pertain to Corinth, and we were actually supposed to move on to Galatians, but I felt as though we couldn't move on without speaking about this final thing that Paul addressed in the book of 1 Corinthians 13. And this thing that he addressed in 1 Corinthians 13 is so important to us as a church because it bears our name, J. Love Ministries. And what Paul began to speak about to the church at Corinth is love. A nice four-letter word called love. 
Yeah, love, right? So, so today we're going to speak about love. You know, the thing about why he had to talk to them about love uh, is because that church at Corinth, as I said last couple of weeks, there were so many crazy things going on in, each, in that church. Corinth itself as a city, it was located in a peninsula uh, surrounded by water. And what happened in that church is uh, in, in that city is that a lot of ships would come in and out. It was a hub for transport. It was a hub for, for tourism. It was a hub for exchange. It was a big port. And because of that, real men used to come in back and forth. People from all different cultures would come to Corinth. And when they would come there, the city itself would cater for that type of life. So there would be a lot of brothels, a lot of casinos kind of thing, real gambling, a lot of bars, a, 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 a lot of prostitution, so many different things were in this place. A lot of revelry. We have carnival once a year. They maybe had carnival every single month. It has some festival taking place. And it was so, so depraved as a place that I found that that was a real difficult place to start a church. You know, I know, yeah, I, I, I pick a nice easy place. Debe is a nice place, right? Nice people along in Debe here. Easy place to come, right? But here it is Paul going and set up a church in Corinth. Such a depraved place. It was so bad that one of their main pagan gods was Aphrodite. We hear a lot about her from Greek and Roman philosophy. Aphrodite was the goddess of love and sex. And here it is, they used to worship Aphrodite in these temples. And things were so bad that because they worshipped her as the god of, of, of love and sex, they would have prostitutes in the temple. Temple prostitutes. Uh-huh. Wow. And to step happy, wow. That's amazing. Yeah. And here it is. They had the wrong idea of what love was. They had a wrong idea of what love was. So I think more than anywhere else, Paul needed to set straight what love truly is. And I think in our world today, I think our love has a misunderstanding and a misconception about what love is. How many of us have been hurt by love at some point in time? You've got your heart broken. Yeah, Brother Ann? Never. You only breaking hearts. <laughs> we, all right, all right. I'll talk to you real later. Right? Yeah, we, we, we all, love is one thing that have broken our hearts so many times. Love is so misunderstood in our world. Love is so misunderstood even in Trinidad in our English language because the same word that we used to talk about how we, lo how we love doubles is the same word we go watch your wife and say, I love you. Or the same way your wife go watch husband, I love you. Do you love your wife the same way you love doubles? Um, well, <laughs> do you love your wife the same way you love football? Um, <laughs> maybe. But you're not supposed to because that love, that type of love is supposed to be something different. And because love has begun, become so watered down in our society and in our culture, love is just a flimsy word that is thrown around. You have 12 year old and 13 year old message and girl, I love you. And I say 12 and 13 in my days is like quite 15, 16, 17. You start to love this one and love that one and thing. All 12 and 13 men have boyfriend and girlfriend and telling people they love each other. You know that's a peppy? In your days, what age it was? Not that age. You had to reach 20. The first time you tell somebody you love them is after you get married. You understand? After you get married. But here it is. Love has become such a watered-down phrase, a watered-down word, that it has no meaning left to it anymore. So Paul had to address love. And what I want us to know today, that even within the church, we have to have a proper understanding of what love is. Why? Because one, our name is what? J. Love Ministries. So we can't call ourselves love if we don't even understand what love is, if we don't know love. And secondly, we must know what love is because the Bible says our God is love. It's not that our God knows love or our God made love, you know. Our God is love. It means to say that's his person, that's his character. He is the embodiment, the personification of what love is. And so if it is we want to know love, we need to get to know our God a little bit more. And that's why I think our world today does not understand love fully because we don't spend enough time seeking God who is love. And that's why us as the church, if we know the true and the living God, we must be a reflection of that love so that the world can see it. Amen? So this is what Paul says. So Paul tells us that, hey, we need to change our perspective about love. And he begins to give the church at Corinth a, 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 a bit of a talk, a bit of a lesson as it pertains to love and what he expects from the church as it pertains to love. So this is what he says. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 to 13. It's the love letter of the Bible. It says this. He says, If I speak in, in the tongues of men or of angels, but I do not have love, 
I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. So he says, hey, you can speak in tongues. It sounds nice. You sound spiritual. You sound like, hey, you're a big pastor. You're speaking in tongues. But if you don't have love, you're just like you're beating our drums there, making noise. It says, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and have all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. Look like so to, to what Paul is saying. Paul is telling the church, in the church culture that promotes so many big and great things in the church, Paul is saying, you could prophesy how much. You could, you could know all the mysteries. You could be the most knowledgeable person when you stand on stage. You could have faith to speak to a mountain and move a mountain. But if you don't have love, you have nothing. I am nothing. He says, if I give all I possess to the poor, I give my body to hardship that I may boast. Somebody said, another version said, if I give myself to the stake to be burnt, another version said, if I give myself to be martyred and I don't have love, I gain nothing. Imagine that. Imagine we could say that, hey, go, Christ, I will die for you. Imagine we could allow ourselves to be martyred and crucified at a stake. And if it is, we do so and we don't have love, it profited us nothing. Then Paul went on to describe what love truly is. And this is what Paul says. Paul says, you see, the, the, the fake thing that, 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 that the world tells you what love is, he said, this is what love truly is. He said, love is patient. Love is kind. When I read these verses, think about when you say you love, whether it be in a relationship or something, and ask yourself whether this is the description of what you feel. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy it does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. Always perseveres. Love never fails. And then Paul went on, brought it a bit more personal. He said, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. He said, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Or I put childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And this beautiful verse, verse 13, it says, And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. The greatest of these is love. So guys, today I want us to know that you see this thing called love the world will try to put so many definitions behind it. The world has such a misconception about it. But we must understand that as a church, we must understand what true love is. And I have three points for us today. And our very first point is love's distinction. Love's distinction. In the first service, I said the primacy of love or love's distinction. I want us to know that love is the thing that is going to set us apart from the world. Because the world thinks that they know love but they don't know what true love really is. Love is our distinction as a Christian and as a church. So if you ask me what is going to make us different from what the world could do, I will tell you love is the answer. Why? Because this is what Christ said. Christ said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. By this shall all men know. So I want us to know that there's a distinction in love. There's a priority of love. There's a primacy of love. Love must go above everything that we do as a church. You know, when I think about church, you know, growing up, I always thought, you know, church is, you know, um, the, the highlight of church is a pastor preaching a real good message. I always thought the highlight of church is, hey, we come to church and we love our good worship. And, you know, in all the statistics that I read, um, you know, about church, I do a lot of studies about church and see how we could grow. You know, what's two things people come to church for? Anybody? A husband or a wife? Okay, that's a good one. That's a really good one. Yeah, some people come in to look for a husband and a wife. And that's okay. That's okay. I'm glad if you could find one in church, right? But two things statistics show that people come to church for. 
They either come for the worship, they want to have good worship, yeah, or they come for the word, yeah. They come for worship or word, and those are two successful, those are two critical ingredients for a church. They come for worship or they come for word. And when I read those statistics, I say, okay, that means we have to have good worship and we have to have a good word. But you know what Paul is saying? Paul is saying you can have a good worship and you can have a good word. But if you don't have love, it profits nothing. So what I would like to see is those statistics change to say, here what? You know what is going to make a church a successful church? When people could come and say, you know what I, I come to church for? I come to church for that love. Because I don't feel that love outside. Because I could hear good music on the outside. I could go on YouTube and find it. But I can't find love on YouTube. You might find it on Facebook like me. <laughs> right? But I can't, I, can't find, I can't find good worship. I can't find good love. You know, unless I come to church. They might tell themselves that, okay, you know, I'm, I, I'm coming to church for the word. But guess what? Sometimes God could speak to you in his word even at home. His rumor word can be expressed to you. You can find a good word pulling up on YouTube or on Facebook. But you can't find love there. And that's why what Paul is saying is that yes, worship word is good. Yes, prophecy is good. Yes, healing is good. Faith is good. But if the church lacks love, then the church has nothing. It says you have nothing. It says you gain nothing. And it says you are nothing if you don't have love. Think about that. And when I think about how important and the priority of what love is, Paul puts the priority of love in the church over three things that we think church is supposed to be known for. One, the sensational things about church. Two, the spectacular things about church. And three, the sacrificial things about church. When I think about church growing up, when I look at the church culture of the world, we have a lot of things that we ascribe to church as being big and amazing. And that's what we call the sensational. How many of us love the sensational things of church? Nobody. Yeah. I'm afraid to say it. I like it. I like to go. I tell her, I like to go. Um, when I was young, I like to go and I like to see them pastor running up and down. I want to hear the pastor crack joke. I want to see the pastor touch a man and he fall down. And as he wake back up, touch him again and fall down. And me and my partner, them, they, hey, hey, hey. You understand? I want to go up for prayer so I could fall down too. You understand? Ryan, come now. You know we used to do that. You understand? All right, just agree with me now, right? We like the sensational things at church. And hear what Paul says about the sensational things. So we might think, okay, that is what church is. I have heard some people sometimes come, one person in particular, not plenty of people, and they say, you know, I accustomed to traditional church. And by traditional church, they mean running up and down and doing all these fancy things, which is good. We still want people speaking in tongues. I want you to know that. We want people speaking in tongues. We want People by faith moving mountains in their life. We want people being healed. We want to see signs and wonders. We want those sensational things that moves our emotions. I want it in church still. But what Paul is saying is that if you're doing all those things in church, but the church lacks love, profits nothing. It is nothing. You profit nothing. You gain nothing. And you are nothing as a church without the love of God. And that's why, you know, that verse says, under the sensational, he says, hey, if I speak in tongues of men of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. So you see those sensational things that we love? We like the noise. We like the excitement of church. We like running up and down. I like them pastors who had nice phrases at the end. And the Lord said, ha! In the word of God, come on, shame, man. Come now, shame, man. All you don't remember them, guys? I, I feel I have to get a tagline in order to get an amen from all your boy. You understand? I think I have a tagline. We're we going to work on one, right? But we love sensationalism. And our world feeds into that culture. They love the sensational things. And if they go to a church and they're not seeing sensationalism taking place or emotional things, they feel as though, hey, this, this church has no power in it. What I prefer to see, I prefer to see the Holy Spirit moving in the lives of people and the fruit of the Spirit being born in them. More than anything else. Because I know the gifts is going to come. Yeah, you can give God a clap. Yeah. Amen. I know the gifts of the Spirit will come. But I don't want to see anybody in our church here becoming a prophet for God. But then they don't have love for their brother. They're still hating their brother in church. I will not have it. I will not have it that we begin to heal people in the name of God. And then we pass in people's street. And we are showing love. No. Because what Paul says, 
You gain nothing, you profit nothing, and you are nothing without it. That's the sensational. What about the spectacular things that we, that, that we put church to be? There's so many spectacular things taking place in church. And again, guys, I love it. I want our church to have these spectacular things. I want us to demonstrate signs and wonders. But what Paul says, he said, if you have the gift of prophecy, the spectacular things, you could fathom all the mysteries and have all the knowledge. You can have faith to move mountains and a mountain move. But you have no love. What Paul says, I am nothing. Imagine that, the spectacular things of church. We live in a church culture today that so many other things are promoted as priority or to primacy or to distinctiveness and distinction in the church. Whereas the church lack love. And people would walk in and out of our church because they don't feel the love in the church. Because guess what? There are people out there who are doing all kinds of spectacular things in the name of other, other people, right? And I can tell you there's maybe other spirits operating there, right? But here it is. When it comes to our church, what is going to make us distinct, based on what Paul is saying, is love. Love must be the lens through which we do everything. So I'm saying here, even as we yearn for the spirit of God even as each and every one of us I encourage you all to seek after the gifts of the Holy Spirit I want us I want prophets to arise from our church I want people with the gifts of healing to arise from our church I want the speaking of tongues and the interpretation of tongues I want the gift of wisdom and knowledge I want the gift of uh, doing of miracles and signs and wonders I want that in our church but if it is we lack love then I don't want it because love is priority love is priority i didn't say that that's what the bible say that's what the holy spirit say the holy spirit say i want to give you the gift but if you don't have love then it makes no sense with this gift that you have and then the last thing in this point don't get excited don't get excited Let me make sure i make that clear <laughs> in this point right love the distinction the primacy of love even the sacrificial things of love sometimes you say okay a good church is one who gives a lot to the poor a good church is one who helps a lot and do these things, which again is good. But sometimes you think that's what church is about. But look at what Paul says here. Paul says, if I give all I possess to the poor, I give my body over to hardship, maybe to be martyred at a stake, to be burnt, allow myself to die. Paul is saying, even if you give yourself to die in the name of Christ, but you don't have love, you have gained nothing. Imagine that. Even sacrificial things. And that's why even as a church, we do a lot of giving. You all will not know because we don't speak about it as much as maybe sometimes we need to share with the church to make people aware of what is going on so we could develop the culture of giving to people within the church. You know, So when we maybe have to speak about it, just know it's from the intention behind us trying to create a culture of seeking one another's best interests. But we do a lot for people within the church. We do a lot for the community. But what we must understand is when we do give, we don't give just to get people to come to our church. We don't give just from a heart to say, well, you know, we do this and we give this. No, it must from be from a place of love. You know, I remember growing up, you know, sometimes people want to go and give hampers. I remember one time we were giving a hamper to somebody in the community, right? And I remember a, a senior person who has been in church for a really long time. He said, hey, though, what are you giving, what are you giving them hamper for? You know how much hamper we give them and they never come to church yet? So I say, so I, I literally do that. Say, All right. I say, but I say, well, you know, your reason for giving hampers will maybe be wrong. Because if you are giving someone a hamper to come to church, then you have a wrong intention behind it. I said, I give a hamper to someone out of the love of Christ in me, just trying to meet the need of someone. And that's it. No strings attached. Whether they come, they don't come. They don't ever have to step foot into this church. We will help them regardless of. We don't say that we help and we give anything just so someone could come to the church. Or they have to be in our church to get something. No, we love. We give because we love. And it's as simple as that. Amen? So what I want us to develop, the culture within our church, is when you give, give with no strings attached. I'm real happy if the person and not coming to church. I'm real happy. I'm real happy if the person feel the love and they say, you know what, I want to go to that church because I felt the love from them. But if that is our intention... Hold off until you get your heart right. Or give it, but pray that God, you know, works on your heart. Because giving with strings attached is not love. And what Paul is saying, you can give everything you have. 
But if it is you don't have love as the intent behind it, love as the purpose behind it, love as the lens through which you're doing this thing, then you have gained nothing. You have no reward to get in heaven for that. Yeah? And that hit me hard. Because what Paul is saying, in the church context, in a world, in a church culture, where we promote the sensational, where we promote the spectacular, where we even promote good things like the sacrificial things, Paul is saying that if it's not done through love, with the intent of love, with the motive of love, with the character of love in it, you are nothing, you have gained nothing, and you have nothing. Yeah? Amen? So guys, we could talk how much, we could preach how good, we could do all the great things. Without love, the church is nothing. And that's because love is our priority as a church. Love is our distinction as a church. The next thing is love's description. Second point, or rather second to last point. That sounds better, right? Second to last, right? Love's description. So what Paul understood, Paul is saying, okay, he's telling the church at Corinth, do everything in love, love this, love that. But then at the end of the day, the people don't even understand what true love is. And we could even be speaking about love here, but if it is we have the wrong understanding of what love is, we can never even act responsibly as a church and actually do what we have to do in love. So what Paul did is Paul said, here what? I know there's a lot of different definitions for love out there. You can find all kind of different definitions because real men is be singing about love. Love is all this kind of thing. Love is a butterfly in your stomach and love is a tingle that you feel when you see love is a flutter in your heart and a uh, man started to sing about what is love, you know, yeah, you know that song, way, <laughs> right? All kind of thing about love and love and love. People writing letters, people writing poems, all kind of things. So Paul say, here what? Let me tell all what is really love, right? I'm going to write it in big, like the woman from up the road, so, right? I seen it, Princess Margaret. I seen it in big. Uh, I seen it in big, right? So Paul makes sure and say it in big, right? And it's what Paul say. I came across this verse, and I really love this verse, right? And we're going back. I didn't put the verse there. I say something wrong, or? Or I just like the lady, too. Huh? I really like she, boy. She's my favorite. Yeah, I see anything big. Princess, Ma Princess Margaret, boy. Right? So, if anybody watching us from away right now, you know, you may not know who this woman is, but feel free to message us. We will let you know. She's a, she's a very prominent Trinidadian character, and we love her really, really a lot, a lot, yeah. So, love's description. So, I love this verse. You know, um, you know, a lot of people get mixed up with this verse. You know, verses 4, straight until 7. Because this verse, a lot of people in movies and all over is just be posting this verse. But this verse comes from the Bible. You know, and it is a beautiful verse uh, written by the greatest author and poet of all, which is the Holy Spirit. That describes what love is. Right? I can't, I can't tell the early morning service that story and don't tell the service and Kim. All right. Yes, yeah, so I was saying, you know, I love this verse because, you know, this, this is, a, is a love letter for me. Love is patient. Love is kind. You know, so, you know, when me and Kim was dating and thing, guess what? I never tell the girl I love she, right? Straight until I wait a year because, you see, I tell myself, I put away childish thing. This thing about telling people you love them, love them after a day. No, 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 no. You understand? This kind of childish thing, I know on that. So I say, here what? I will say this thing when I mean it, and I take a whole year. Before that, maybe I don't even know if I say I like you. Uh, you understand? So I not even go in there. I give it a whole year. Because I wanted this thing to mean something. I wanted love to mean something. You understand? So, you know, I went to, um, you know, so I, I, I decided if I have to tell this person that I love them, I want to know, understand truly what love means. And where I could understand what love truly means is where love came from, which is God. And I went back to the Bible. So when I had to tell, you know, um, my wife now that I loved her, what I did is that I made a nice letter for her. And how I did it is, you know, I, I, write the, I, I type, out, type out the letter, and I put this kind of cursive writing that looked like long-time writing, and I dip it in a bowl of coffee water, and you get it nice and a kind of brown color, you know, I know some fellas in the morning, I see some of them young boys, them taking, writing on notes. And I see Aaron, look, Aaron pulled out your phone already, yeah? Renny, Aaron, have your phone out taking notes here, <laughs> right? Okay, so, pass how, how, much, how much spoons of coffee, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Yeah. How, how much water, how, how much spoon, where's the, spoon, where's the water to coffee ratio? Right? So, yeah, so I, I dip it in the coffee, I got a nice kind of brown tinge to it, so it look kind of vintage. 
and then I, 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 I wait till, you know, men fall asleep and thing in home, and I light up that stove there, and I burn the edges. Yeah, sure when you do that already. Yeah, you burn up the edges there, and you can always, you, you book it to flake it out kind of way. So looking kind of old and, um, you know, vintage, then you roll it up like a scroll. You know the thing? Killer, you, you, you got that too. <laughs> right. And then you wrap it with a nice kind of string kind of thing now. You know? What do you call it? Ribbon. Ribbon, yes. <laughs> nah, it's more, it's more kind of string. Twine. Twine is it. You see how they're trying to crack, man. Crack him I'm wrong. It's not a ribbon. It's a twine. You wrap up that. Sister Peppy, you like, you get one of that, Sister Peppy? Sister Peppy, you get one of that? Where? Well, you get letter. See, I know they like letter, right? See, I, I wrap it up so bam, and right there in the, in the letter there, I didn't have to make up no fancy words deep in the ocean written in blue tree tiny words, I love you, all them kind of things. That's, that's one of Jeff lines, eh? right? <laughs> I get that from Jeff, right? I say, no, no, no. I go into the Bible. I say, hey, love is patient, love is kind, does not envy, it does not boast, is not proud, does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And I pray that the love that I have for you could be this type of love. And give she that letter there. And I get through. Yeah. Aaron's still writing notes here, and he, and he pretending here. Yeah, he pretending. Oh, gosh. Hey, we, we can talk after. Yeah, don't, don't, don't worry to take notes now. Go ahead. Yeah, my whole time, I had to take notes and for that. Right? So yeah, and that's, that's what I understood as a description of what love is. So now here it is. Paul decides here what? Love, let's talk about the portrait of love, the, the, the description of what love is. And Paul begins to describe love. And I, I created a nice little um, table here because Paul understood that people in the world, they have a wrong understanding of what this love is. Because they say they love, and then love is just a noun for them. They don't act upon the love. They say they love, but then their character, their characteristics, their um, actions prove totally otherwise. What they say, what they do, it, do it, it does not coincide together. So Paul says here, what, I need to give you a good definition of love. And this is what Paul says love is based on what the Holy Spirit inspired him to say. He said this. He said love is some things. He said love is not some things. He said love does not do some things. And he said love is always something. So I broke up that verse into this. It's a nice table to remember. He said, one, love is patient. So if it is, think about your relationships. Hey, where are you, Kim? <laughs> yeah, sure. All right. <laughs> Have all patience now. <laughs> right. yeah, she cannot take all. <laughs> anyway, so love is patient. She go on there. She go on there. That is it there. Yeah. She can't stay up here and blush. Who will service now? You understand? So love is patient. So think about the persons that you say that you love. Or even think about your relationships at work, at school, wherever you are, where you are supposed to love. Every single relationship, every single communication that you have, as a Christian, you are obligated to love them. And I want us to know that. You see what the world will tell you? You are only obligated to love your wife and your children and friends and people who love you. But what I'm saying is that every single person that you come in contact with, you are obligated to love them. You don't have a choice in the matter. Because if you are saying that you are Christian, then you are obligated to love. Because God loves regardless of. And what he is saying, the type of love that we have to show to the world is one, that love has to be patient. So we can't say that we love and then we are not patient with people. We get fed up very quickly with people. We, 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 we lock off people very quickly. How many of us, as soon as somebody wrongs us once, lock them off one time. Quick lock off. You understand? Some of us have a very, very um, uh, low tolerance level for people. As soon as they wrong us once, lock off one time. We are not patient. If God has to lock us off every single time we do wrong, where would we be? Each and every one of us, well, we, 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 we going straight to hell. I can tell you that. But I, I'm thankful that because God is love, his love is patient with us. Amen. And that same type of patience that we have received, we must give it to people as well. No matter how bad we think they are, love is kind. That speaks about the outward act of what we feel on the inside. So when you love someone, that love must be demonstrated by kindness. 
acts of kindness. What I want to encourage you, church, if you love your community, if you love each other in the church, look for an opportunity to be kind to one another. In your community, look for an opportunity. If you truly love your community, look for an opportunity to be kind to someone. You know, last year, uh, you know, we would have started, you know, um, a particular, um, you know, uh, what's the word, a project where we are speaking about share love. And we actually gave these little cards where we told you all, just look for an opportunity to do acts of kindness and you just leave the card with them. The card don't have to have anything in it. It, just, it was just J-Love, God loves you and we love you or something like that. And it was just looking for acts of kindness. So when you love people, if we truly love, we are going to look for an opportunity to show kindness. So I want to encourage you today, if you're going to love, look for an opportunity to be kind. Love is not proud. When we, some, many of us, we love people because of the pride behind it. Many men has gotten married to women because they were a trophy wife. So that they can post a nice picture and say, hey, what's your, what your wife? I get. You understand? Many women has married men for what they have. The pride and the prestige that came behind his name. Many times we have relationships and friendships based on who the person is. Who the person are. Ah, who the person is. I'm saying. I'm saying. Is. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Once I understand. How many of us do that? And it's the pride behind it. We just want to look good. We want to have the best. We want. Love should not be about pride. It should not be about boasting. That was the next one and that does not. Love should not be self-seeking. If you truly love someone, husbands, if you truly love your wife, you will not only be seeking your best interests. Wives, if you love your husband, you will not be seeking your own interests. Children, if you love your parents, it is not only about you, 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 and what you could have. Because I could tell you today, you have a lot that your parents did not have. Yeah? 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 You have a lot that your parents didn't even have. So it shouldn't... Yeah, parents are like, give hey, yourself a clap. Yeah? Yeah, I could tell you that the parents I see today, sometimes I find that they're going overboard. And maybe when I have my child, I might go overboard too. I don't know. But I find parents just go overboard with how much they have to give the children. And children could just be so spoiled about it sometimes and feel like they are entitled to it. Entire, yeah? Feel like they're entitled. Par Children feel like they're supposed to get a phone when they want a phone. Children feel like they're supposed to get a tab if they want a tab. They're supposed to get KFC anytime they want KFC, or they're supposed to get Starbucks. Yeah, they're supposed to. Yeah? No, you're not entitled to anything. But I'm grateful that the parents in our church, because they love with the love of God, they don't seek their own betterment. They, are, they seek the betterment of their children and of their families, and that's true love. And so children, give your parents a clap right now. Thank them for true love that they are displaying to you. And so in the same way, even when they're giving you licks, yes, it's seeking your best interest. They, yeah, they, they, they're giving you licks because they love you. You understand? Who God loves, he chastens. You all know that? How the Bible say? So who your parents love you, they will chasten. I tell you, if parents are not correcting children, I question whether they really love their children or not. Because if you love your children, give them some good licks. Let me move on. Yeah? We are in put away phone, yes? We, you see what? <laughs> that man phone go already. <laughs> you take down notes after all, boy. Right? Yeah. Right. So, love, guys, if we love each other, let we, let we don't only be seeking our own, own interests. Even at work, seek the interests of others. Don't be easily angered. Right? That's a big one. We say we love each other, but everybody like have a short fuse. Everybody like a ticking time bomb. Yeah, our wrong people, yeah, like you're walking on eggs. If we're supposed to love each other, why are we getting vexed so quickly with one another? Why in the church we get vexed and we fall out so quickly? You understand why with we neighbors we fall out quickly? Why at work and school? You understand? We, 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 we unfriending people. You understand? You don't talk about unfriending. Never go on by envy. Does not envy, right? Don't be jealous. If you truly love, you're in the church, you truly love, don't be jealous of each other. You understand? When a brother in church does well, let us celebrate wins together. You understand? Let we celebrate wins. When it is someone has a hard time, let we comfort one another in those moments. You know, let, let we don't be jealous of one another. Brother so and so get a car, go show him. I go and buy a car just like him. You understand? But, uh, I, I, I drive in somewhere with somebody and they show him my house. Um, when one person paint the house, another person in the village going and try to paint the house. Yeah. When a person build up something, another person going to try and build up something bigger. It's like, oh, oh, don't try to outdo. You understand? Jeff had some partners in work. When them talking, 
And a man say, well, boy, I'm going to buy 5,000 gallons. And next man go jump up, buy 5, buy 10,000 gallons tank. You understand? We're going to celebrate the win for the man now. Eh? You understand? Yes, and when a man get a job, let's celebrate the win for the man. Don't be vexed and say, how come he get a job and I didn't get a job? How come he get this and I didn't get this? How come that man get a wife and I still single? You understand? <laughs> how come she got, she got a good, good husband and I, I still struggling? Oh gosh, your time will come, your time will come. Celebrate wins with each other. Na. Let me celebrate wins because that's what love does. We celebrate wins and we comfort each other in times, of, in times of sorrow. Right? We don't envy each other. Apply that at work because I know in church here, all are we nice, we love each other. And so it's easy to do that, right? It is the clap. You understand? I know in church, guys, I can tell you. In church, that one place you can get a clap. You can come up and sing off note, off key. You can come up and forget what you're supposed to say. You understand? And everybody. Oh. <laughs> and then you all of a sudden, and you come, hey, good job, child. Good job, good job. No, it was it. didn't really do that good. You understand? Yeah. I get out of time. You really do that all that good number. But once that good job and good job. Okay, everybody just feel you had encouraged. So that's good. I like the cult here in church, right? But at the end of the day, guys, we celebrate wins. Let's comfort each other and let's be true about it, right? Let's not dishonor others. If you truly love someone, you will not dishonor them, right? So marry people. If you love your wife, you will not dishonor her in front of other people. You will not disrespect her in front of other people. Keep your business between both of you all. Don't go and talk that business with any and anybody. Because not everybody's seeking their best interests. Of, of plenty of people want to hear what's going on with all you, so that they could go and tell so and so this and so and so that. No, don't do, do, do get caught up in that. Respect one another, honor one another. Don't dishonor. Children, don't dishonor your parents. Don't go by your little friend and them. I say it, <laughs> I say it to the parents, you see it. Don't go by your little friend and them, right? And, and, and dishonor your parents and say, my mother dishonor, my father dishonor. Oh gosh, that's your mother and your father. Who going to give you food at the end of the day? Your, your little friend and them? No. Who going to put clothes for you on, on your back? Your little friend and them? No. Who going to send you to school? Your little friend and them? No. They must send you to school. You understand? It's your parents who want to do that for you. Don't dishonor them with your little friend and them. You understand? And no matter what you feel about your parents, I know, gosh, you're young, you feel like your parents don't understand and they just don't understand me and all these kind of things. I know, I know. Go well, honor them still. Because the Bible said, honor your father and thy mother. If all you want to learn how to live long, all you want long life, the Bible tells you it's not only that and exercise. Honor your father and your mother so that your days will be long upon the earth and blessed upon the earth. So honor. Next one said, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. So when you truly love, do delight in evil things. You can't entertain evil within your family and within the church. As a family, you can't be seeing things wrong within the home and doing wrong and you entertaining that and delighting in that. How much parents, they see the little child cussing like when and them laughing, kya, kya, kya. Always act like if I Larry Joseph here, boy. It's only, it's a serious thing. How much parents laughing at that and posting, hey, watch him now, watch him now. Yes, and, and child cussing in her. And parents promoting that delighting and evil. You understand? Your daughter leaving home dressed all kind of how. And watch how she looking now. She, she growing up, eh? No. I want to show you your, your, your partner in the hair salon, eh? Watch how she looking here. You understand? No. No delight in evil. Bible talk about mothers dressing. You understand? Fathers, no delight in evil when your son talking to about five girls at a time. No. No delight in evil. Because that's wrong. The Bible says rejoice in the truth. And in church here, when things are going on in the church that is evil, gossip and backbiting and bad talk and undermining and all these things, don't, don't, don't give your ear to that at all. Don't give your ear to it because the devil will use you. You will see. I say this morning, anytime we hear things in the church, we have this four letter word that we say. Eh, uh huh? E H E H. Eh, uh huh? E H E H. E H H E H whatever. Eh, uh -huh. five letter word, whatever, right? Eh, uh -huh. you understand? We like to hear when a man come with a piece of gossip. I I would like to tell you if a man, if 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 a, if a brethren just call me just like that, say, hey boy, hear this now. Nah. Yeah, boy, tell me now. Nah. You understand? <laughs> I want to hear. I want to hear. Eh, uh, tell me now, nah, boy. We want to hear. 
yeah, 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 we delight in evil. We like to hear a scene. But my score is now, where's the latest? Where's the latest? Nothing happened. And you're vexed when nothing happened. No, I'm used to thank God nothing happened. You understand? We vex. Wait, wait, nothing happened, boy. We driving down the road, a man getting an accident. All of a sudden, it's traffic there. Everybody will see what's going on. We, we like, we like. And that, that's the world we live in. We delight so much in evil. Sometimes you scroll into Facebook, nice God thing coming up and thing. But let's have a fight now. Yeah, you must see this fight here, boy. We men, men get some good slap, boy. We delight in evil. But what God says? He says rejoice in the truth. If you truly love, what love does is that love rejoices in the truth. So when you hear all these kind of things, don't, don't delight in, in, in evil. Find what truth is and rejoice in the truth. And the church has come to a place where we just rejoice in darkness more than the truth. That's why the church today, anytime you try to correct a wrong in the church, yeah, people act as though you're being discriminatory. People act as though you're being too harsh and they're stepping on toes. No. If people are doing wrong things in the church, you just have to stand for what is truth. We know we are going on, I know going on delight and evil taking place in the church. No, I have to rejoice in the truth of what the Bible says, even if it means stepping on toes. We just have to do that because that's what love does. And love holds no record of wrongs. Amen? Husbands, wives, no record of wrongs. Parents, children, no whole record of the wrong. The child reached 20 years now. Don't hold them to what they do when they're five years old. You understand? It always protects. When you love, you protect. When you love, there's a trust that is built. When you love, you hope. And when you love, it perseveres. You're going to stand the test of time. And that's the type of love that Paul wanted the church to have. A love that protects one another. A love that trusts within the church. A love that hopes for better. And a love that perseveres. And that last word was love never fail. And that's where we go to our last point today. So we've seen that love's distinction. It's priority. We see love's description, what love is. But we also see love's durability. Um, early on in, in, in today's service, I spoke about the, 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 the permanence of love. Love must never fail. True love never fails. Many times we say that we love, but we fall in and out of love. I want you to know today that falling in love is an accident, because falling is an accident. You have to grow in love. Love is permanent, right? Love is durable. It stands the test of time. And the type of love that we must have for people must be one that is permanent. It must be durable. That means to say that when people enter our church, that love that they felt on that very first Sunday, if they come ten times, they must feel that same love ten Sundays later. Amen? When we reach 20 years as a church and we move into a new big building and thing. Yeah? Right? That quality of love not, must not must not supposed to change. We must have that same type of love. People mustn't come and say, well, boy, think feeling different. You know, since we move here, they mustn't think that that love come from this building here. You understand? It wasn't the, the, the carpet on the floor that gave the love. It's the people. So even when we go to our new building, that love must go with us. And 20 years from now, people must still be speaking about the type of love that they found at J-Love. Because we are just love ministries. So love must stand the test of time. No matter how many things we will go through as a church. We will go through some tough times as a church. No matter how many things you go through as a person, don't ever let the devil steal the love of God in your heart. Let that love remain permanent throughout your walk until you leave this earth. Don't let anybody ever say, well, by that, she was a real loving person, but they're not so loving anymore. No, we must always be people of love. And this is what the verse says from verses 8 to 13. It says, love never fails. And the reason why love never fails is because, you see, God is love. So what that means to say is that God did not create love or just create love. It's not that love is just the character of God. It's not, it's not that love just pers is personified by God. The fact is God is actually love. God is love. And so if God is love, and God is infinite, God has no beginning, God has no ending, then love has to be infinite as well. It can never fail. Because God never ceases. So therefore, love could never cease. True love, that is the agape love of God. And it's what Paul says. He says, where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, it will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. So all those things that we love in church, the prophecies that we love in church, the tongues that we love in church, the knowledge of uh, what we learn in church, what Paul is saying, all those things will pass away. 
He says, for we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. So what Paul is saying here, he says, you see this thing called love? We prophesy in part. We speak in tongues in part. We don't have a full understanding of what love is, right? Because we know God, but we have never seen God in the fullness of who he is. And he went on to say, when I was a child, I talked like a child. When I, uh, I, I taught like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. He says, now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even, now, even as I am fully known. What Paul is saying here, a time is going to come when Jesus is going to return. The embodiment of who love is and what love is, is going to return. And we will see Christ for who he is one day. And when we see Christ for who he is one day, we will actually understand for the very first time what love truly is. That's when we will understand what love is. And that's why he's saying right now, we understand only a part of what love is. Christ has displayed love through dying on the cross for us. We only have a, a glimpse of what this love looks like. We don't really understand fully what love is like. And what, 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 what Paul is saying is that a time is going to come where we are going to understand the fullness of what love is when we see Christ one day. And when we see Christ one day, we will finally understand the fullness of what love is. And I know many people in this world, they are searching for love right now. You have been looking all over for love. But I want you to know today that because love is God, that God-shaped vacuum you have in your heart that you are searching for love, only God could fill that. Because only God is that agape love of God. Amen? And only when that time comes, when we see our Lord, when we see our God, only at that time we will understand fully what it is. So what Paul said here? Paul says here what? He's speaking about all the amazing, the spectacular, the sensational, and the sacrificial things about church. He said all the prophecies is going to cease. All the tongues is going to cease. All the amazing things is going to cease. And he said, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. So he's saying, you know, when I was a babe in Christ, I saw church as just about the prophecy. I saw church as just about the tongues. I saw church as just about these things. But he missed the understanding that it is, it is these things through the lens and through the motive of love. Because love was the priority. But as he got older and he understood that being a Christ-like person, being a Christian is about the love through these things, that's when he began to have to put away childish things. He stopped coming to church for the hype and the excitement. He stopped coming to church for the spectacular things to take place. He stopped coming to church thinking this is what church is about because he understood for the very first time that it's not about those things. It's about the love of God. Love being made known to him and the love that he has to share. That's why Christ said, above all commandments that I will give you. He says, love, your, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. All the law and the prophet hangs on these two commandments. And if we understand as a church, put away childish things, all the hype and the excitement and the church culture that exists today, once we begin to tap in and make love our priority, Knowing the love that God has for us and making that love known to our world around us, that's where we will actually gain something. That's where we will actually be something, as Paul would say. Because the sad thing is, many of us will prophesy in the name of God. Many of us will preach in the name of God, drive out demons. But you know what the Bible says in the book of Matthew? Jesus said on the day of judgment, when we stand before him, there will be people who will say, Father, have we not prophesied in your name? Have I not preached in your name? Have I not driven out demons in your name? You know what Jesus said? He will tell them. He said, in that day, I will tell them, depart from me, you work of iniquity. I know you not. So we could preach. We could speak in tongues. We could do all these things. We could be a mega church, but without love, we have nothing. Because in the end, these three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest is love. Greatest is love. Why the greatest is love? Because love is the entire personification of who God is. We would need faith in eternity, you all know that? We would not need faith or hope in eternity because we will have hope with us. We will have, what, we are, what, what, what are we faithful about? The Bible says faith is the substance of things hoped for, 
the evidence of things not seen. But when we see Christ in his fullness and his glory, we will have him right in front of us. No need for faith. No need for hope anymore. I gave the example earlier, you know, think about you, you, you want something for Christmas. You want a nice little toy car for Christmas. You want a jersey for Christmas. You're praying and you're hoping you get it for Christmas. You have faith that you'll get it. You're hoping you'll get it. And when Christmas comes and you open that gift and you see it, do you still continue to hope to get it? Do you still continue to have faith that you're going to get it? No, because you got it already. So in that final day, when we see the fullness of the glory of Christ, in that final day, we don't need faith anymore. We don't need hope anymore. We're going to need the love of God. Because it's the love that we have for one another and the love for God that is going to be the connection through eternity that we have. Because love is the only thing that is going to remain. Amen? In eternity. And any man who lacks love, they do not know Christ. And Christ cannot be in him. That's what the Bible says. If you are born of Christ, you must love. Those who do not love is not of Christ. And so today, that's why love has to be our greatest priority. To know love and to make love known to our world today. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand at this time. Let's just bow our heads and close our eyes. I just want you to meditate, you know, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed about, you know, what love is to you. You have seen what Paul describes as love. Think about your relationships in your life, your marriage, your family, your children, at work, your friends at school. Ask yourself, am I truly loving them the way God wants me to love? Or am I just loving with an earthly type of love that might eventually fail? So many people in this world have grown in and out of love. But as a church, we don't want to love like that. We want to have a love that always protects each other, always hopes, always serves, always preserves, always perseveres. We want to have a love that will never fail, a love that will stand the test of time. We want to be the embodiment of love on earth because our world is in need of that right now. So many people depressed. So many people don't know love. And we have the greatest gift, who is Christ himself. We need to make him known to the world today. Think about your relationships today and just begin to pray over your own relationships today. That you begin to be, become more loving. Begin to become people of love. Love must be our first nature. It must be our go-to characteristic. When people think about us, what they should describe us as isn't just how we look, but they should describe us as someone who is very loving. A person of love. That's what we should be known by. When people think about our church, they should think about people who love. Even when love hurts sometimes, we must still be people who love. Just pray over your own relationships today, over your own life, that the love of God becomes very apparent in your life. Yes, God. Dear God and Heavenly Father, we come before you in no other name but your Son, Jesus. Lord, I thank you, God, for the love that you have shown us, God, first of all. You have shown us the example of what love is, God. Your word said, greater love had no man than this, than a man should lay down his life for his friend. And I thank you, God, that you have showed us love first, God. Even while we were yet sinners, you have died for us, God. You love us, God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, and we thank you that we have seen an example of love in you because you are love. And the more we know you, God, is the more that we are going to learn love and know love, God. So, Lord, let your life and your light and your love become so apparent in our lives, God. Let us have a deeper understanding of this agape love of God. Let that love begin to transform and be infused in our life so much, God, that we begin to infect the world around us with that love, God. That when our friends at school, at work, when our neighbors, when our community, even within the home, when they experience God, our love in interaction, God, they will know you. It will be pointed back to you, God. When they ask, how are we so loving? How are we so kind? How are we so patient? 
it will be a testimony of your love in and through us, God. So, Lord, in those times where it's difficult to love, when we face hard times, God, and challenges, even people who come up against us, and it's difficult to love, that's the test of love, God. I pray, God, that we will succeed in that test of love. We will not fail that test, God, when people come up against us. But even they, we will love. We will love our enemies, God, as we love ourselves. We will love our neighbor as we love ourselves. So, Lord, give us that type of love that can reflect you well so we can make you proud, God. That the world may see your love. They will see our works, God, and they will glorify you in heaven. So, Lord, give us that type of love. I pray for that special blessing of love over our church, God. That our church will be known for its love. We will develop a culture of love within the church. Love will be our priority, God. Even as we seek after the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we will do so, God, from the intent of love. We will want to prophesy out of love. We will want to speak, God, out of love. We will want to heal out of love. We will want to do miracles and wonders in the lives of people in your name because of love, God. And not for personal gain or to boast or for envy, God. But because of love, God, let love be our priority, God. So that, Lord, at the end of it, God, we will not stand before you and you say you don't know us, God. So, Lord, help us to know love and to walk and to live in love. So that, Lord, we can be like you, God. So when the fullness of your glory appears, when your fullness of who you are is made manifest to us, God, we can connect with that. We could understand it because we have understood love, the agape love. So help us to be loving, God, to one another. Help this church to be one of love. I uh, dismantle any, uh, any spirit, God, that is out to cause this unity within our church, God. Anything, God, to pull down any brother or sister or any relationship, God, within our church, we come against it and we say only love will prevail and pervade our space, God. I pray for love even in the leadership, God. The way we handle God as a leadership, it will be one of love, God. We will bring ourselves under the understanding of love as leaders to be patient, to be kind, to be merciful, God, to be long-suffering, God, even as we lead, God, so that that love, God, will flow from us firstly, God. Lord, I pray for every ministry of the church that when we operate, it will be done in love, not just for program, God, but it will be done for love, God, because we love people. We will share Christ because we love them and we want the world to know about this love that God has for them, God. So, Lord, let love be our priority, God. Let it be our distinction, God. And, Lord, let us do it in such a way, God, where it represents you well. Take full control. I thank you, God. Lord, even if there's anyone in need of anything else in their church today, whether it be a health need, whether it be finances or a job, or some hard time that they are going through, God, I pray that you begin to touch them right now. Let your peace be with them. Let your comfort be with them. Let them know that everything will be okay. Because you will never leave them. You will never forsake them, God. You are there with them, God. So, Lord, touch them at the point of their need. I thank you. In no other name but Jesus. Amen and amen. Let's put our hands together for God today as we have our seat. Amen. You may have your seat. If there's anyone in need of uh, any prayer personally afterwards, feel free to see us. We'll be happy to pray with you. Amen. All right, so how many of you all enjoyed uh, or blessed by our service today? Yeah, we were. Amen. You know, today we want to pick up today's offering and tithes. So as the ushers come, let's just bow our heads and close our eyes as we pray. Dear God and Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your offering, for your tithes, God, that will be picked up today. I pray, God, that will be used for the furtherance of your kingdom. Bless those who would give and even those who may not have. You bless them and provide for them. I thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. All right, so just a couple of announcements. Uh, this Tuesday at 10 a.m. will be our prayer faith service. So if you're at home and you'd like to join us uh, for a time of encouragement and prayer and word, feel free 10 a.m. Uh, on Tuesday evenings at 5 p.m. We will be starting a new baptism class. So if you would like to be baptized or you would just like to learn more about Christ, feel free to see Pastor Sandra um, we will join you to that class. Uh, Friday, 6 p.m. would be our youth meetings. Um, on Saturday at 6 a.m. will be our prayer intercessory. If anybody has any specific prayer need, you know, for a family member or even yourself or your family, feel free to see Pastor Sandra. We'll be happy to pray for you, um, even if you would like us to do so anonymously. I want to encourage you, church, as well. We have a prayer box when you're leaving. Feel free at any time. You know, you can um, write a prayer request um, and put it in the box. It goes directly to our intercessors, and they would like to pray for you. 
Um, on this Saturday, a very special announcement. Our women and men's group would be having uh, a movie night at 4.30 p.m. You know, the woman is really hosting, but they have invited the men to be um, to come along. Um, so it's a good joint um, meeting, um, you know, that we would have. Um, they would be showing a, a lovely movie, um, mostly toward uh, married couples, but also for those intending to become married. If you're 20, 25 and over, you are very much welcome to come. You know, uh, we would have a, a movie and it would be a short discussion possibly afterwards. And I think it's great. I want to encourage, you know, husbands and wife to come out um, or even, um, you know, single people. You will learn from this movie. It's a very strong, um, you know, it's, it's very strong in the word of God. And I think that we can benefit from it, you know, especially discussion. So I encourage you all, you know, come out to that, um, you know, meeting this, Friday, this Saturday at 4.30 p.m. You know, we'll be having that men-woman group. Next week, Sunday, 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock will be our normal services with our Sunday school at 8 a.m. I want to encourage our evening, our second service here, 8.50, 8.50 a.m. for Sunday school. I want to encourage this service, you know, let's begin to invite, you know, others, you know, to this uh, um, second service, you know, our morning service is packed. Um, there's not much room, actually, in the morning service, but definitely for the second service, you know, I want to encourage you all to invite friends. Maybe don't tell them about the 8 o'clock one. Say, hey, we have church and it's at 10 o'clock. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're not lying. You're just saying, hey, yeah, church is at 10 o'clock, you know. And yeah, let, 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 let them come at 10 o'clock, right? Um, so that we can have, uh, you know, a greater time. But as I say, guys, I'm happy with, you know, um, even, you know, um, you know, how you all are because I think it's be much energetic here um, this evening's second service. So I'm happy to have us here. So we're going to close now with a prayer. Any more announcements? That was it. Okay, so let's all stand at this time. And we want to close in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Dear God and Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time spent in your presence. Lord, as we go to our various homes, take us there safely. Help us, you know, through this week, God, to understand what love is, God, and to begin to act more like you, God, and to display your love around, God, to this world, God. As a church continues to work, to continue to work in and through our lives, God, and even as we would go, God, take us safely to our homes. Bring us back at the next appointed time. In no other name but Jesus, amen. And amen. As you leave, tell at least three to five people that you love them. Amen. Three to five people that you love them. of people long ago that had a faith in God to do the impossible. Noah built an ark, though it had never rained. David threw a rock to a giant and he was slain. That is what faith can do. Lord, I ask for you to use me too. God, give me faith to move the mountains Trust what I cannot see Help me to do all things Through Christ who strengthens me Please you if I don't believe No words can save me But the grace you have given me Just one touch from you My life would be made clean Lord, I surrender to the plan you have for me Oh, so God, give me faith to move the mountains Trust what I cannot see Help me to do faith finish the race till i see you face to face lord let your will be completed in me so i'll have
that faith that can move mountains I'll trust what I cannot see You'll help me to do all things Through Christ who strengthens me yeah.